saying, Lab Alexandrov here for CreativeShrimp.com. This is the first chapter of Cinematic Lighting course for Blender now on YouTube, as promised. In this tutorial, which is split into five parts, we're gonna be coming up with the cinematic lighting setup for the object or still life shots like this one that you see on your screen. The full lighting course is linked in the description, so if you can check it out, I would appreciate that. We're gonna start from scratch and then gradually explore all the steps of this formula so it can be applied to a variety of different locations and shots. This formula is extremely versatile. After setting it all up, its components can be mixed to your taste and adapted to the needs of the project, no matter if it's a dramatic, moody composition or an upbeat and evocative still life. To not reinvent the wheel and keep it simple, you can reuse the components of, of this scheme or this formula in your own work. So our subject, or rather object for demoing this lighting scheme, is gonna be this bunch of minerals. It is a nice little object that has a variety of textural details and has a little bit of everything in terms of materials. It is fairly reflective, but not super reflective at the same time. It shows a fair bit of ver variable roughness, so it's neither super glossy nor super diffuse. It even allows a bit of light to pass through it with the help of the subsurface scattering, which we will discuss a bit later on. So, as I've said, it's a little bit of everything, it's a perfect demo object for this kind of lighting setup. Now, an important note. Even though the subsurface scattering looks beautiful um, for the purpose of the tutorial, to keep things simple, I guess, uh, we will turn it off. So once you open that demo scene in Blender, you will find out that the subsurface uh, is turned off, is switched off. It will make uh, our minerals look like they are made of clay, which is perfect for our training purposes. So let's keep moving! Ta -da. Okay, before actually getting our hands dirty, we should probably set our Blender up, our cycles up and have a look at the scene. But why do we use Cycles Render Engine for this lighting tutorial? First of all, it is a pure path tracing render engine, which means it's the closest we can get in Blender to the way light actually behaves in the real world. With Cycles, the light just behaves realistically right out of the bat, so we don't have to even think for the most part about global illumination and other realistic lighting effects, so we can focus on what truly matters, which is creating cinematic and yet believable lighting. Thanks to the recent advancements in Blender, such as general speedup and denoising, ray traced rendering became much faster than it used to be. In the old days, one frame of path traced animation could easily take a few days to render, but fortunately, these days are over. And with the rise of GPUs and the advancements in technology, the viewport rendering and Blender as well became a thing. In other words, we'll leave the burden of technical lighting calculations to cycles and focus on the creative side of it. Once you open the demo file, you will see a bunch of minerals arranged on the table, and that's how it should look. But first, let's jump over to Preferences and make sure that within the system settings we have our GPU visible. We can tell that my render device, which is NVIDIA, the GPU got recognized, there are different options available for accelerating ray tracing, such as CUDA and Optics, with Optics being available on NVIDIA GPUs only, and being the fastest option that I know. Then, if you own one of the AMD graphics cards, you'll be able to choose the HIP instead. But I'll stick to Optics, though, currently. Ok, throughout the tutorial, we're gonna use Cycles Render Engine to keep things slightly more streamlined and realistic right out of the box. So, within the Render Engine drop down menu, I'm selecting Cycles and making sure that the device is set to GPU compute. GPUs render much, much faster in Cycles than CPUs generally. What I usually like to do when dealing with lighting is create two windows one for the final render view. Uh, which will use the rendered mode of the viewport, and the second one at the top for the material preview. Here we got our camera through which we will see our final shot, our render. Now the render icons are located at the top of the user interface of the viewport, there we can change it from the default shading mode to the material preview one, and to the rendered mode, which is right over there. 
it will enable the Cycles Path Trace and Rendering mode in this particular window and we will use it throughout the tutorial, so let's keep it turned on. Depending on the video card, it can be rather slow or pretty fast, but let's keep it in the rendered mode for now. And the top one will be our material preview mode to make sense of our scene. It will use some random HDRI included by default with Blender. But no matter the HDRI environment chosen though, the point of this viewport is to be our secondary monitor with the lights and the UI elements on all the time. That is our working environment decoupled from the cycles rendered view if that makes sense. If you don't want to use a generic HDRI there, you can switch on the scene world and scene lights which will make it look fairly similar to the rendered mode, but I will disable all these options. I need this HDRI to just have enough information to see things clearly, because you know our bottom view will be constrained to the to what the camera sees, and it will be fairly slow and stuff like that. Okay, going over to the environment settings, we can tell that the only light source our scene has is this abstract gray environment. We can play with the exposure of this default blender environment, but actually what I'll do is reduce it all the way down to zero to start from scratch. Our cinematic method implies that we start from scratch anyway. Okay, so Blender cursor can serve as the spawning point for the for any kind of objects. So when I press Shift A and add the area light, it gets spawned just on top of 3D cursor. We can click and drag to make it larger or smaller. Um, if we press T to open the left tool shelf and select uh, the uh, the transform gizmo. You can actually use uh, the handles of this gizmo to move, to, uh, rotate, uh, scale up and down our light source. But um, usually I like to do it in a slightly different way, utilizing Blender hotkeys. So G is to move the objects around. Uh, the movement can be constrained to X, Y and Z axes by utilizing the X, Y and Z keys. The same with rotations. R to rotate, X, Y and Z afterwards to constrain it to a certain axis. And finally the S shortcut scales the object. Not a whole lot of things to remember. Uh, G to move or grab, R to rotate, S to scale. It's good to remember these three. These shortcuts quickly become second nature for moving objects, in this case light sources, around. And when it comes to adjusting the light source settings, as a quick refresher we have this green light bulb icon within the Blender user interface, uh, and there we can access all the settings like the color, the power, the shape of the light source, uh, the size, whatever else. Everything can be adjusted from there. Changing the size from, from that menu is practically the same as scaling the object. So it's uh, interchangeable in this sense. And whatever you're gonna do, don't you dare unticking the cast shadows button in cycles. <laughs> shadows are important. Mm -hmm. Okay, throughout the videos you will see me accessing the objects in either of these windows, sometimes in the rendered view, sometimes in the material preview. You will also notice me toggling off the visibility of the UI elements with this button in the rendered view. Sometimes the user interface can get in the way, especially when there's a lot going on in the viewport. So shutting the noisy UI elements up uh, really helps to focus on what matters. What else do we have here? As for the camera, we have one here in the um, Camera 01 Outliner collection. Uh, we can press 0 on the numpad to jump into the camera view, or Control 0 to make any camera the active one. A nice little hack in cycles to juice slightly more performance out of it is to press Ctrl B and draw the rectangle around the viewport, or rather around the camera view, or actually around uh, a portion of the camera view even. Uh, that would constrain the render region around that particular portion of the viewport, and within the view output properties you can see the render region uh, checkbox that can be turned on and off and basically that, that is it. Again, uh, we can switch between the, the, the random modes using these icons, or we can press Z to bring up this pie menu, 
whatever feels more comfortable to you, I guess. So I think that should be it for the basic Blender setup and for the settings that may come in handy throughout the tutorial. Uh, once again, the render engine uh, has been set to cycles, the device to GPU compute to avoid any confusion. Uh, as for the light paths, there is no real need to adjust it. Well, maybe I'll limit the diffuse, glossy and transmission bounces a little bit to speed up the viewport. And this is it. I also have a personal superstition about increasing the indirect light clamping just in case to not lose the precious rays generated by cycles. More about that later. I will show some comparisons and stuff like that. Now I'll just say that this is it for the boring part. The cycles is set up, the shortcuts are mentioned. Nothing stops us from diving deep into setting up lighting, so that is what we will do in a moment. And by the way, if you have any questions uh, about setting up the blend file or accessing the project files, uh, feel free to reach out to us or to other students of this particular course uh, in our Discord. And now on to the exciting part, setting up the key lights or the main light. The key light is usually the brightest and the most visible light on set. Its purpose is to highlight the form and dimension of on-screen subjects. Without realizing it, we have already created one. So let's just promote it to the key light row and call it like that. I'm rotating it in such a way so it faces the camera and then extending it a little bit and making it way larger. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna position it on the other side of the scene so we shoot in shadows and it will become clear why in just a moment. For now let's leave it there make it r relatively large and then head over to the light settings menu and adjust its power. Now it's a little bit too weak uh, to pretend to be the key light, uh, so let's give it a boost. Well, it makes sense to talk about brightnesses or light ratios when there's more than one light in the scene, and we will talk about that, but so far I'm just trying to make it sufficiently bright. Mm -hmm. Now it packs a punch without going over the top in terms of brightness. It's sufficiently bright to serve as our main light. Then the next property that we're gonna adjust is its size, uh, which directly connects to softness. The rule sounds like that. The smaller the light in proportion to the subject, the harder. And vice versa. The bigger the emission surface, the softer. Given the bigger source area, the transition between the light and the shadow becomes less sharp and less pronounced, and that is what we call soft. As usual, why not throw in a visual comparison? Soft light means a gradual transition between light and shadow, hard light means razor-sharp shadows. But then it's all about the gradient between lit and shaded areas. The gradient that depends on the size of the light source. It's really easy to see how the gradient gets stretched on increasing the light size to the point of a super ambient and slightly flat lighting, and then on rolling the size back, it collapses a little bit. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to establish a neural link between the light size and softness and this gradient. Okay, what I usually like to do for moving the light source around is press dot and select 3D cursor as the pivot point. Alternatively, you can find it in, in this menu. By default, it's set to active element. We just change it to 3D cursor and then shift and right click on any kind of surface and with the light source selected, press R and Z to constrain the rotation to the Z axis and it will pivot around your 3D cursor. Isn't that great? So now it's time to talk about the direction of the light source, just after we have talked about the power and uh, the softness. The direction means a lot in lighting. For example, now we have placed our light in a rather frontal way, and thus we have flattened the image quite a bit. More often than not, we don't want it. We don't want to flatten our stuff. By moving it off to the side, we make sure that the light is now splitting the object so it got the much-needed contrast between brightly lit and shadowy sides that is already in the zone of sculpting shape with light compared to more frontal light. 
So key light that comes in from the side is already more dynamic in how it creates the shape and reveals the depth of the minerals and the stuff around it. It can be placed overhead for the top light or moved to the side. Or maybe you can place it directly on the opposite side in relationship to, to the camera. So it's now technically a backlight, even though it's a key light, our main dominant light that still creates most of the form and definition in the scene. And actually with this particular light placement, we now shoot in shadows. We shoot in, in, into shadow side and that is called upstage lighting or reverse key lighting. And if there is one little thing that we can do to make our scenes more cinematic right away, is uh, shooting into shadows. Mm -hmm. As simple as drawing the, the line and placing the key light on the opposite side from the camera. So now, even though the scene lacks any kind of fill, uh, we can appreciate the transition between light and shadow, and all the shadows actually falling in, in the direction of the camera, which makes it look three-dimensional and great and cinematic. And actually, to prove this point in a fun way, let's select the camera and the key light and pivot it around our minerals. <laughs> Funny enough, we can tell that by keeping the camera on the opposite side of our key light, uh, we make sure that there is no flattening going on. It becomes hilariously hard to screw it up, right? It still feels pretty three-dimensional due to the key light position. To recap the placement of the key light, it's actually super important to consider to what extent does it actually help you to model the shape and dimension of your subject when it's placed on the camera side, when it's, let's say, kind of frontal, or does it make more sense from the cinematic standpoint to highlight the shape and the object to actually push our key light to the opposite side of the scene? So we shoot into the shadow side, as it makes the light and shadow play much more dynamic. And 9 times out of 10, at least in my opinion, the reverse key lighting or the upstage lighting uh, is much more cinematic in terms of revealing the form of the object indeed. Not to take away anything from the more frontal light projections, but undeniably uh, they are a little bit flat sometimes. And it's good when you need such flatness for whatever purposes. But if your goal as a 3D cinematographer, as it happens, is to enhance the depth and enhance the dimension, that makes the reverse key lighting a no-brainer, in my opinion. It works with the hard lights as well, it doesn't really matter. The overall direction from which the light hits the object matters the most here. Uh, the same uh, principle would be the right word applies here not the hard-coded rule, and if it was the rule, it could be broken, but the principle. The fronty light has usually less dimension than the side light, or any other combination of the light hitting the object at an angle. And of course, it's all relative to the camera position, so if the camera switched sides, the light should jump to the other, other side of the scene as well to maintain the reverse key lighting. So that, I think, could be a key takeaway, no pun intended, for choosing the direction of your main light source. Actually, we take a look at lighting direction in the reverse key lighting video, which I recommend watching after this one, as it gets straight to the point and tackles this very important light characteristic. Thank you for watching, this was the part 1 of the still life chapter from Cinematic Lighting Course, now on YouTube. In this video we focused on nailing the basics. Namely, we started from scratch and made the first step by setting up the key light that offered us the main exposure and direction for our scene. In the next part, we'll keep building upon this by adding layers of light and interest.